Hi, everyone. Oh, man, it's nice to be here as per usual, but also teaching at Big Heart City with like that huge space on Friday. Some folks were there. I kind of I like was afraid. There was like so much sound in the room. and It was kind of bouncing and it, I have a reoccurring nightmare that I'm teaching, but no one can hear me. And so I have to yell, which is entirely antithetical to the Dharma. And I'm like, what? Like bodhicitta, you know? <laughs> so I was feeling that a little bit. So it's nice to be here in this wonderful space with you all. And we'll, we'll give folks a little time to settle in. There's a really exciting pre-announcement we have a wireless mic, y'all. Hey. Yeah, no more of the kind of like lounge singer act of <laughs> bringing it across the room. Um, so that's exciting. That's a huge update for folks right there. So you can um, turn it on when we get into that portion. And yeah, I'll go ahead and welcome folks here to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome, 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 welcome. This is an entirely volunteer run space. We, we literally exist here out of generosity, which is so beautiful. And this is very much a community center, meaning the community is why we gather here. The community is what makes this place actually have its purpose and benefit. And yeah, I, I, I've been feeling quite fortunate recently um, reflecting on the community that we've built here over the years. And whether it's your first time here or you're coming a lot, I hope you can feel some sense of that community. And the community that we invite here, you know, it's in order so that we can see ourselves more clearly, receive the teachings, and feel, you know, an ability to be honest and open about our struggles on the path and also where things are really lighting up. And one thing I've noticed about our community is in the sharing, there's a lot of learning, just hearing how people are integrating this into their path, into their life, and hearing where it feels like, uh-uh, <laughs> not me, I don't want that. That is also, yeah, really beneficial. So thank you all for making this community and this night so unique. These beings will never be here in exactly the same way, so... Thanks for making this such a special evening. We're going to do a couple, we're gonna do one initial practice and then one longer practice as we are making our way through this wonderful text, which is the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, a secondary commentary by Pema Chodron. And we're still like deep in chapter one and we might stay here for a while. Um, chapter one of this text, for those who are not familiar, it's an eighth century text and essentially outlines uh, inspiration for us to dedicate and commit our lives to transforming our hearts and minds for the sake of all being. And this first chapter is really an impassioned plea of why, why we should cultivate <clears throat> this aspiration. And I, when I taught on Friday, I gave like a little primer to this work to Vinny's group. And um, someone asked such a great question. I, I just have to share it here. She was like, wait, so waking up for the sake of all beings, this is something I'm gonna add to my practice. I'm like, yeah. She's like, I'm already tired. <laughs> like I'm so tired and I, I get it. Who feels tired here? Yeah. I don't want to make you jealous, but I had a nap, so I don't feel tired. But generally, <laughs> generally, I know that feeling. And there's, you know, there's the physiological sense of fatigue if you're not sleeping or if you're working too hard and exerting. And then there's the like psychological, emotional fatigue, right, of this world on fire. And then there could be the spiritual fatigue, just that longing in our hearts to be more free. And so the fatigue, it makes sense. But what I told her and, and what I wanna share with you all is making clear and apparent your intention to wake up for the sake of all beings is not as tiring as trying to ignore everything that's making you exhausted. It's actually like this, you know, possible source of clarity and brightness and dedication. 
because whether or not we want to dedicate ourselves to transforming so we can wake up for all beings, there's suffering right out there. And when we go outside and we meet it, what is our heart? Like, how is our heart meeting it? When we meet it with that kind of, oh, like, I can't, I'm tired. There's like an extra strain and drain that happens to us, right? And it's a wonderful author and teacher and trauma therapist, Resma Menikam. Some of you may be familiar with him. He wrote this beautiful book, uh, Grandmother's Hands. And he talks about the ways that our bodies, you know, somatically uh, experience systems of oppression. And specifically, he's talking about racism and that every body experiences the weight of oppression, whether you are engaging in kind of um, outright activity of being oppressed or oppressor, there is the weight of it. And he invites people to move from the dirty pain of oppression to the clean pain of oppression, which I think is an interesting framing. And the resonance I see with us opening our heart to suffering is, are we going to stay with the dirty exhaustion of trying to avo avoid, deny, and distract away from the suffering out there? Are we going to kind of open to integrate and work with, like, there's more suffering than I can meet for myself and everyone else? Because this world, you know, the kind of contract, we're born, we get old, we die, and there's a lot of unnecessary suffering on top of it. So how do we meet it? And so I do think this path, this bodhisattva path, is an opportunity to meet it with such warriorship, really. And the warriorship is getting clear, just getting clear of our path. So hope that doesn't terrify you, but inspires you. And <clears throat> where I want us to start tonight, um, as we did a bit last week, and we'll probably do every week, is to really consider intention. What is an intention? Because in many ways, this guide to the Bodhisattva way of life and becoming a Bodhisattva, so Bodhisattva is a warrior of compassion, becoming a Bodhisattva really is a, <clears throat> it's a lot about setting intention through everything we do, every, like our body, our speech, and our mind, really getting clear. And for many of us, we're moving through the world and we have you know, an idea of our intentions. If we're practitioners, maybe we have a little bit more clarity on intention, um, but it kind of gets a little fuzzy. It's like, yeah, I'm compassion, wisdom, some of that stuff. I'm gonna meditate. I, I think I'll be like less annoying of a person if I meditate or I'll sleep better, or et cetera. But when we really get clear on intention, it can transform not just our practice, but every single thing we do, everything we do. And as I mentioned last week, come on in, no problem. Yeah, no problem. There's some seats around here. Is that water ball at all? Seeking enlightenment? It's okay. I think that's a seat. Hmm? <laughs> it's on the path. Okay, fine. <laughs> fine. You're here with us too. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Water bottle on the path. Um, there's a there's a really beautiful linkage between setting our intention which helps us get clear, of course, on our motivation, aligns us with purpose. Purpose begets our sense of meaning, and meaning is what makes a fulfilling life. So setting intention isn't just, oh yeah, this is something I should do, this is you know, something the Buddhists do, it's this will actually get me towards the sense of joy, happiness, fulfillment I seek. When we are aligned with our sense of purpose and meaning, that's like the richness of our life. And this intention of the Bodhisattva path, you know, this very outrageous intention of as long as space remains, sorry, as long as space endures, as long as there are beings to be found, may I continue likewise to remain, to drive away the sorrows of the world. This kind of outrageous commitment to dedicate ourselves to transforming this heart and mind 
so we can be available to more clearly guide others to transform their hearts and mind for all time. Not just this lifetime, but all lifetimes. Such an outrageous one, that intention. And maybe, you know, maybe we just try it on. Like, what does that feel like to consider? What if that is kind of behind my thoughts, ideas, feelings on a day-to-day -day basis? What if that's like residing in the way I perceive the world and the way I'm meeting the world? Like, what would that feel like even for an hour to really embody that? And it's really especially potent when it aligns with our more momentary or maybe more kind of just day-to-day -day aspirations and intentions. So I would love um, to hear from a couple people if they're willing just to kind of get the grist for the mill of this intention practice. What are your intentions for being here tonight? This could be a word or a phrase, but I'm just curious just so we can kind of help ourselves get towards that. Chris, are you moving towards the mic? Okay, great. And then you can just pass it because there's no cord. But you gotta turn it on. Nope, just press the button on the side. Now it's green. Okay. So can you say a little bit more about this concept that we were working with previously of warmth? Because I think I actually spontaneously experienced it. Mm, yes, that happens. Yeah, yeah. So that would be my, and so now, and it was like, oh, wait, I recognize this. Mm. I have done this before. Yeah. But this time, I'm going to find a way to remember it. Mm. So that's know? the intention. And what, what did the warmth feel like qualitatively? It was, you know, you know Carl Rogers and the unconditional positive yeah. regard. Yes empathy and presence mm, beautiful yeah and and it is all about having been coming here mm. every week for over a year yeah i i i'm in the middle of, of kind of a bold move right now and having this practice mm. is the only thing keeping me grounded i would never have the courage to make this move if Yay. it weren't for this beautiful practice and that spontaneous you know there's a term spontaneous presence right so spontaneous presence is is something that occurs on the path when you know without trying or you know exerting like we are in that warmth and i love that the carl rogers that kind of you know attuned caring presence of the loving figure that some of us were lucky enough to have not everyone yeah, and it didn't happen like when I was in practice or, yeah. you know, it happened when I was going from the Zoom station to the kitchen for a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> Anyone else? And then what is your intention for being here this evening? Or if you're like, I don't know what that means, help me out. Also good. Please, right. It's consistently been a seeking of liberation, but the longer I've been coming here, the more I've realized that, at least to me, liberation feels like a sense of spaciousness. Mm. And the more I do this, the more I discover what spaciousness -ness is can feel like. Mm. And uh, yeah, that's the intention, keep finding more space. Beautiful. Yay! I feel there's a great Yiddish term, naches, which means like, you know, the appreciation of your offspring, but you're not my offspring, but like student, you know, like, yay for both of you, warmth and spaciousness. Yes, it's wonderful. I'm going to go completely to the other side. Okay. Jean and I, we have been going to two cemeteries yeah. to see where we're going to be buried. OK. Hmm. I never thought that I was going to do it one day. I was going to die and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And suddenly we are there. It's absolutely, completely business. <laughs> I mean, with the guy you're in front of, the woman who's in front of you, 
she's only thinking, I'm going to get that much money from this. Hmm. Um, and I say, okay, she's working on that. So hmm. yeah, you have to accept it. That's one little thing. Yeah. And then the other thing is to die. That's the big one. <laughs> <laughs> very big one yeah so much that i've never uh felt almost talking about something the need of crying mm. i feel like i'm gonna cry mm. not that i didn't know it Not that we didn't have to do it to prepare for mm. that, which means we do have an end. And it's not so far away. Yeah. And um, oh, I'm almost becoming a believer. Oh my God, help me. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And can I ask, how does that inform intention for the Dharma, for meditation? For you? Well, um, I feel that the right thing for everything is to keep on living. Mm -hmm. The Dharma has been for years and years and years my life, part of my important part of life. And uh, I think that that has put me in a place of, of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Reality is this one starts here and this same one stays and goes away here. Yeah. And uh, not to be so surprised. Yeah. And also be prepared. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, all of these practices, especially the meditations, are preparation for death. You know, we talk about that more around Dia de los Muertos here in the center, but you know, there is, according to, I'd, I'd say, pretty reputable sources that you read these Tibetan books of death and dying, and you see this, um, this way that there's a description of as we are leaving this world and the consciousness of this world, there's so much grasping and aversion and that wild elephant of your mind. It's not like it goes quiet all of a sudden when you're nearing death, right? So how do we enter and meet the dying process with peace is the same practices that we're doing. Yeah. For, you know, finding peace on a day to day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting warmth and spaciousness. You know, there. I understand why they could be seen as the opposite of preparing for death, but they really, you know, and there's something unbelievably liberating about every day, the reminders of impermanence, you know, it does that in and of itself can be such a commitment and motivation for practice when we really see that. So, yeah, please. <laughs> I was there on Friday night and like saw people going like, oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and like that was my reaction to the first like couple times that we when we started this book, I was like, I'm not coming back. No, thank you. Like, <laughs> I'm done after this. But like after this lifetime. Yeah. Okay. After, not to the after center. tonight. No. <laughs> <laughs> like when I die, I am not coming back to this plane of existence to like continue. But um I was remembering like kind of like when I was younger, when I was like in my like teenager year, like 14, 15, and I was starting to kind of like like awaken to what was going on in the world. And like all I wanted to do was like what I guess I can conceive of as bodhicitta, right? Yeah. And but I like instead started like doing a lot of other things um, and got like pretty detoured. Um, <laughs> But I think like just remembering that that was sort of like my original intention mm. when I came into like my own consciousness 
of who I was as a person. Um, mm. And just like, I feel like this is like coming back to that, like yeah. honoring that. Yeah. I'm so glad you see that. And I'm not that tired, actually. <laughs> That's wonderful. You, you want me to talk? <laughs> Why are you here, Lucas? What's your intention? Um, well, I think after COVID ended, um, well, like when things started to open up, I was living in LA and I was kind of sick of meditating alone. And um, so if you, I think like connection or community sort of, a, if you were to pop it into one word. Um, yeah. And uh, I, there's just so much that I've learned from not just meditating in my house alone every day, you know, to, to come in here um, you or the teacher that uh, I was seeing in, in Los Angeles um, weekly and then being able to talk to people about what what they do um, daily for their practice or how they're sort of treating struggles that, that come up in their life and, and applying, you know, um, you know, med meditation into every aspect of my life and the, and the Dharma and every aspect of my life um, becomes more real, um, realistic, if I'm sort of surrounded by other people that are on a similar path um, and taking their suggestions and anyways, so I'm not gonna drag, Community. drag. Yeah, yeah, we'll just keep it, keep it there. So uh, <laughs> yeah, beautiful. maybe it'll change in six months, but yeah. Yeah, and I think it is okay to have flexibility, not okay, it's wonderful to have flexibility in our intentions and motivations that are shaping us on a day to day. But to have that like larger frame, that broader umbrella of what we're here for, what we want to direct our lives for as being dedicated to others, it's just, it makes sense. Because we don't live in a world that is going to be free from suffering anytime soon. It's probably going to get maybe worse soon or go up and down for a while. And so how can we have what is the most precious gift in the world, which is peace of mind, you know? So how do we actually move towards it is dedicating ourselves to being part of the solution and not part of the more suffering. And we create more suffering just by not waking up, just by being one more reactive person in this world, right? So just by not taking the call to the bodhisattva, not dedicating yourself to practice, you're kind of part of the problem, sorry. <laughs> kind of part of the problem. So I'm not trying to bully anybody into their bodhisattva <laughs> vows. Just wanting to be real. And um, yeah, and again, try it on. So we're, we're gonna start with the intention and kind of sit with it and really feel at an embodied level, what is it like to reflect on or come up with an intention that feels personal and then reflect on and connect with this broader bodhisattva intention, this vow. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about one of the main ways that we can start working with this wild elephant of the mind. So the last couple of weeks of this book, we've been working with the compassion practices that help tenderize the heart, create empathy. But another huge part of our bodhisattva activity is being able to, um, as Shantideva says, like use mindfulness as a tether as a tether to kind of keep down the wild elephant of the mind. And in another part that we haven't read yet, he talks about it's kind of mindfulness is like your sentinel at the door, right, of the mind. And so one way that we can direct our mindfulness is to the mind itself, directed directly towards all this chaos of thoughts and longings and delusion and craving. And yeah, it's a little unpleasant to direct ourselves directly towards it but extremely powerful. It's like, instead of trying to push against all this energy of the mind that's constantly coming, we, we surf it, like we ride it, right? We ride on top of it and allow our practice to have these um, opportunities to be with both the movement of the mind and the stillness of awareness. Okay, so first let's set an intention. So find a posture that brings a sense of dignity, uprightness. If you've ever seen a, 
there's these beautiful um, <clears throat> statues of Shantideva, and it always depicts Shantideva kind of, they're not leaned forward towards the suffering of the world, but kind of this like seeing of everything, this leaned back posture, but this, you know, still the heart is forward, the face is soft and gentle, and the spine is just upright, elegant. And take a moment and just notice what's ever present in the body. This could be the physical form body, so if we feel that sense of physical fatigue, Noticing what might be quite familiar aches or areas of tension. And then noticing the level of emotion residue in the body. What are we carrying or holding? And allowing those beautiful sighs to happen or just a sense of accompaniment with whatever is that residue here in the body. Allow ourselves to really feel ourselves in this room together. This beautiful summer day, so rare in San Francisco. And yet here we are, gathered inside together And so considering what was that motivation or intention for coming here tonight? Maybe something arises immediately or maybe it's a bit uncertain. If something arises immediately, just keep noticing. Maybe it unfolds or shifts or changes. And if nothing is arising, no problem. Just imagine what an intention to be here might be. And take a moment and let a word or phrase of intention be repeated silently, almost as though you were whispering it to your own heart. And with arousing this bodhicitta, this awakened heart, the shift is really expanding the sphere of our concern and care. We could imagine whatever our intention or aspiration is, what if we wished it for everyone? Notice how that might tenderize or tug at the heart. 
feel and imagine the possibility that we could support not only ourselves, but all beings in experiencing whether it's community or spaciousness, warmth, embrace of impermanence. Keep checking in with the body, noticing any shifts or changes as we consider this wider, vaster view of who's included in the sphere of our compassion and care. Really taking to heart, this doesn't mean we necessarily do more. It means what we do, we do skillfully with a clear intention. May I transform this heart and mind in order to be a better vessel to support the awakening of all beings. May I be an island for those who need landfall, a lamp for those needing light. For those who are weary and tired, may I be a bed. And for those who are sick, may I be both medicine and doctor. Just one or two more breaths here, noticing what it's like to really focus on the intention and let the intention be a felt sense in the body, releasing the concepts and words. So we will do another practice. That was just our intro. Any questions, comments? How did that intention feel this time? I see a nod, that's good. A heart online, thumbs up, yeah. Hmm, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Doing that together is so beautiful. For friends online, um, someone in the room said it felt like a group of redwood trees all together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, again, I just want to emphasize, I completely understand why the woman at the Big Heart City last week said, I'm tired. Like you're asking me to open my heart wider? Like, hell no. And yet, you know, this this kind of like energy and dignity of the vow. I don't know, just keep an eye out for it. Because I think when we feel that exhaustion, we're slipping into this sense of, oh, now there's something I need to do. I have to control how it goes. Like, I can't just, you know, have a sense of, 
wanting to alleviate suffering, I have to do, there's got to be an action plan. Um, and so to maybe, if you notice that that's happening, which can lead to overwhelm and despair, just lean back a little and consider just the, the bigger way that this can be a, a view, not just a action plan. So I want to share some of the verses here. This one, um, you know, the last ones I think we read together, which is worth repeating. Those who wish to overcome the sorrows of their lives and put to flight the pain and suffering of beings. Those who wish to win such great beatitude should never turn their back on bodhicitta. This idea that by moving towards bodhicitta, it actually helps us with our own kind of personal suffering. Um, not only does it help other beings, but it helps us get clear on the factors that are in the way of us feeling joy in our own lives, which is beautiful. And this idea that like the shift in not only ending our own suffering, but like really having the intention for that to flow through with others. Um, and then the next verse here, should bodhicitta come to birth in one who suffers in the dungeons of samsara, in that instant he is called the Buddha's heir, worshipful alike to God as men. So this is kind of an invocation or an invitation that anyone can experience bodhicitta. And in that moment, even if just for an instant, they become as though they were like the offspring of the Buddha. But I love this term, the dungeons of samsara, because I can, I know what that feels like. So that's the mind of, you know, unending hope and fear. Really want this to happen. I really don't want that to happen. That's the rumination we get, right? Like, oh, not this, not this, not this. Oh my God, I need this. That's the dungeon of samsara. But should bodhicitta come to birth in one who suffers in the dungeon of samsara, in that instant, they are called the Buddha's heir worshipful alike to gods and men. So I, I like this idea and what Pema Trojan says is, even when we feel trapped in our repetitive habits, samsara, right, doing the same thing over and over, we can feel kindness and empathy for others. If we have this momentary flash of bodhicitta. And also what I think is interesting in this verse, and this is a lot of, you know, at the time, of the Buddha and also in the in the teachings in the years after the Buddha, there was a very hierarchical system of religious practice in which folks were, um, you know, in the in certain castes, they were not allowed to practice spiritual practice of any kind. And this kind of commentary that anyone can be a Buddha's heir is also kind of a revolutionary idea that you don't have to be from a certain caste to experience bodhicitta. Even those who are considered at the lowest caste can be the Buddha's heirs. Um, and I also, uh, Pema says, you know, bodhicitta isn't an elitist theory for sophisticated, well-educated people. It's for everyone. We never have to feel we're too hopeless to call on bodhicitta, nor can we ever look scornfully at others and label them too frivolous or arrogant to qualify. Everyone in the dungeons of samsara is a candidate for awakening a compassionate heart. So I think that's like a really beautiful message. I don't see bodhicitta trending among many influencers these days, but it could, right? Just because you're like caught in the samsaric materialistic, you know, next thing more, like at any moment, bodhicitta could occur. And it could occur, you know, spontaneously, like Chris described warmth, just, you know, happening spontaneously, like all of a sudden the sense of, wow, I really wish all beings were free. And, you know, maybe we just, again, we have that sense of it for ourselves or someone we love. When we know someone who's sick and suffering, how much do we want them to be free? Like a lot. And what if we just open that to everybody? Like in an instant, we can see that bodhicitta arise. In the next verse, for the supreme substance of the, for like the supreme, all of these are analogies of what is bodhicitta like. 
Like the supreme substance of the alchemists, it takes the impure form of human flesh and makes it a priceless body of a Buddha. Such is bodhicitta, we should grasp it firmly. So I don't think, you know, human flesh is impure, I will say that, but this idea that literally anything we are doing through our body, we can use that as alchemical fuel for the fire of awakening. There's nothing we are doing in our body, whether we are um, having, you know, a hard night out with substances or vegging out with television or eating too much or, you know, whatever it is, any of that, any of the suffering that comes from that, we can use that as fuel for fire for our awakening. It's just interesting, like with bodhicitta, with this motivation, like may this pain I am experiencing help me see the pain of others. Likewise, we can have that with the good. They don't say that here, but in the next chapter, anything we're enjoying, like I saw a lot of people enjoying ice cream cones on the way here. We can say like, may, you know, may I share the delight in this ice cream cone with all beings, right? It's just this like, kind of without having to think about it hard, opening of the heart to everyone, opening of the heart to everyone. And the next verse, if the perfect leaders of all migrant beings have with boundless wisdom seen its priceless worth, we who wish to leave our nomad wandering should hold well to this precious bodhicitta. So this is a bit of a reference towards um, if we know and have studied especially the lives of those who have experienced awakening you know we've looked at the life of the buddha and um, shantideva or many other priceless teachers and we can see that even in our lifetime with the dalai lama Thich Nhat Hanh, I mean, so many teachers where you sit with them or even see a photo of them and you're like i want that whatever that is that like joy sparkle peace i want that they are like very reliable. These are the kind of, um, you know, and, and often, right, they have no material wealth. Uh, not always true, but very little material wealth. So let's leave our, I love this, nomad wandering, like looking for a home or a refuge on the, un, on the shaking ground of samsara, right? If I just get this next like, on my post, I'll be happy. If I get this new apartment, if I get this, right, this, that like nomad wandering, us looking around for home, looking around for a sense of place. This is where we are inspired to then, well, what did all those, you know, beautiful enlightened beings have? A dedicated heart of awakening for the sake of all beings. You hear the author, Mathieu Ricard, we, we covered his book here, I think during the pandemic, a while back now, beautiful writer, beautiful teacher, humanitarian. And when he tells his own story of how he came to the path, he was like a young man in France. He's probably in his late seventies now. He saw these photographs in an exhibition of all these great Tibetan masters. And he just was blown away. He was like, what is that look in their eyes? What, I need to go there left his PhD program, traveled over to India and was like, oh, went back, completed the PhD, dedicated his life, like sat at the feet of, for those who know, uh, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, who was such a beautiful teacher. Anyway, it's, but it was like these photos, he could get that transmission of bodhicitta. So look for the reliable sources. All other virtues, like the plantain tree, produce their fruit, but then their force is spent. Alone, the marvelous tree of bodhicitta will bear its fruit and grow unceasingly. Um, and I like the way Pema Chojan describes this. She says, it's compared to a wish-fulfilling tree that produces fruit forever. By contrast, the plant plantain tree bears fruit only once before it dies. Likewise, helping someone is always a good thing and will bear fruit in a limited way. But if our help is motivated by the longing to free this person from confusion altogether, it will bear the fruit until they attain enlightenment. So they're actually offering the same kind of care, but there's a commitment. Like, I'm not just gonna help you once. Okay, I did my good deed for the day, I'm done. It's like, I'm committed to you until you wake up all lifetimes. Like that's an unending uh, gift. A simple act of kindness with bodhicitta intention can open up open us up to this expansive possibility. 
in the next verse, as though they pass through perils, guarded by a hero, even those weighed down with dreadful wickedness, will instantly be freed through having bodhicitta. Who then would not place his trust in it? So this idea, as though they pass through perils guarded by a hero, even those weighed down with dreadful wickedness. So this wickedness, you know, it's again, it's kind of an intense word, but it means when we are engaging in activities that are unskillful and harmful towards others, we are creating the path of more unskillful harm towards others and more and more suffering, right? The kind of law of karma. And if we are, if no one on our path, there is no hero, is there no one who's with us to show us a different way? Like bodhicitta is, a, is helping us get out of this entrenched karmic habit of self-centeredness, just thinking about ourselves, just moving towards ourselves. So it's like this hero, and this word hero really means a friend who says, maybe you should stop doing that thing you keep doing that you always complain makes you unhappy, right? Like that's bodhicitta. It's like, hey, there's another way. And then um, the last verse here of this couplet, just as by the fires at the end of time, great sins are utterly consumed by bodhicitta, thus it benefits, thus its benefits are boundless as the wise and loving Lord Buddha explained to Sudana. And this idea that just as the fires, by the fires at the end of time, it's interesting the way Pema describes it is it like a fire that burns up our negative tendencies. Ordinarily, we kind of buy into them and we continue to act in these harmful ways over and over. But this idea that bodhis, the bodhisattvas practice in the middle of the fire, they enter into the suffering of the world. They stay steady with the fire of their own painful emotions. They neither act them out nor repress them. They're willing to stay right there and explore an emotion's ungraspable qualities and fluid energies and let that experience link them to the pain and courage of others. So I love her interpretation. I would have never gotten it from those verses, but I just want to say, I just think this is so beautiful. So this idea of practicing in the middle of the fire is entering into the suffering of the world and staying steady with the fire of your own painful emotions. So this is now we're starting to look at not only why we should arouse bodhicitta. Oh, wow, it's like a, a tree that always bears fruit. It's like a friend that protects us from our bad habits. And it allows us to be right in the pain of the world and right with our difficult emotions. And in fact, is the intention and aspiration to stay with our difficult emotions and not perpetuate them. And to let that experience link them to the pain and courage of others. I'm going to say, yes, one or two more things here about bodhicitta, um, especially there's a, a relative and an ultimate, meaning there's the everyday bodhicitta of like what we're engaging in and acting towards to be a benefit to others. And then there's this state at some point along the path where without a thought in our mind, bodhicitta just flows out of us. It's just, and we have it for all beings without any thought. We've let grow of self-grasping. But we'll stay with relative for now, much more relatable. And that there are these two aspects even of relative bodhicitta. Um, and this relates to our um, intention or aspiration, as well as our like, active activity and our action. So Shantideva says, bodhicitta, the awakened mind, in brief, is said to have two aspects, bodhicitta and intention, and then active bodhicitta, practical engagement, wishing to depart and setting out upon the road. This is how the difference is conceived. The wise and learned thus should understand this difference, which is ordered and progressive. So in order for us to set out on the road of any of our road trips, if we're lucky enough to have a road trip this summer, you have to first plan the road trip and then get on the road. So the aspiration, it really matters. To have the aspiration, may I you know, give up self-grasping, may I really be of service, 
and then to start and act it on a day to day. But I, I really like this idea that, you know, the aspiration, it's really important practice for us. And Pema Chodron, you know, she, she offers this uh, example. She said, one way is to kind of engage in generosity. And at the level of aspiration, you might look around your room for something you love and then visualize giving it away. Maybe it's your beautiful red sweater, a special book or chocolate you're hoarding under your bed. You don't literally have to give it away, just visualize this. Then expand the offer to include millions of sweaters, books or chocolates and send these out to particular individuals or the universe. In this way, our aspiration accomplishes two things. It fulfills our wish to lessen the pain of self-absorption and our wish to benefit others. Moreover, if we aspire for others to experience not only our gifts, but the joys of an unfettered mind, our intention becomes vaster still. So it's such a simple little thing that we could practice and do together, right? Of, okay, I'm gonna look around. What am I willing to offer up? What would I like to give away? How would I give it away? I tried this, I was like, oh. I mean, I have two copies of that book, so I guess <laughs> definitely give that away. <laughs> But it's, you know, just this idea of like what it feels like to consider giving away. And, you know, I've definitely seen this among, you know, monastics who are living communally where they have like no possessions. You've given up everything, that full like, you know, renouncing. There is a freedom in that of like the ties and bonds we have to our material objects. So just this helping to condition our mind towards generosity. And you can do that again. I mean, she gives you this easy out. You don't actually have to give it away at first. You just practice imagining that. Because it's not. Because we're usually we look around a room and we're like, I need more stuff. Better bookshelf, right? Oh, it would be nice to have linen pillowcases. It's so hot, right? Whatever more. And instead, just the opposite. It's very against the grain for us. Um, bodhicitta and intention bears rich fruit for all of those wandering in samsara. And yet a ceaseless stream of merit does not flow from it. This will arise alone from active bodhicitta. For when with an irreversible intent, the mind embraces bodhicitta, willing to set free the endless multitudes of beings. At that instant, from that moment on, a great and unremitting stream a strength and wholesome merit, even during your sleep and inattention rises equal to the vastness of the sky. So this idea that at some point, the aspiration turns into action. And Pema says that aspirational bodhicitta brings enormous benefit um, at the level of intention. We begin with manageable for us and we let ourselves evolve from there but that our intention at one point can start to become irreversible. It takes on, as he says here, it's equal to the vastness of the skies. When we no longer question the wisdom of thinking of others, we truly know this to be the source of indestructible happiness. Something shifts at the core of our being. And when it does, we experience a ceaseless flow of benefit even during sleep. So at some point, right, of like practicing, like I would give this away and I'd give this away and I'd give it away to everyone and I'd give it away so they would be more free. We're kind of practicing with that. I give this away, I give that away. This beauty that I see on my bike right here, I give that away, right? This pain that I'm experiencing, may it be helpful for me to know others' pain. It's like always others, always others, always others. Like there's a tipping point at which it becomes the steady stream. Like it has its own momentum. I mean, you know, and it feels far away, or it can, because we've been practicing this one self-centered way for so long. But does that seem like a possibility? Could you imagine that becoming like thinking of others? And I just think of, you know, until a child is born, I don't think parents know what it is to be a parent, right? And then all of a sudden there's like this being and it's like, oh, it's all about them. Right? So that's like this really profound shift of moving your perspective, your goals, your priorities. 
And it's interesting in the next verse, you know, um, Shanti Deva says, even our parents couldn't have as vast a view of generosity for us in the world as bodhicitta. So it's just this really boundless generosity. So those are the verses, again, trying to rouse your excitement for bodhicitta, even on a warm night. So, you know, um, I want us to do a practice of awareness, but I'd love us to stand up first. Get a little movement going in whatever way feels right. Helping get some tension out of the shoulders. Maybe rolling back. swaying, whatever feels comfortable in your body. Visualizing a mini espresso and feeling that <laughs> make its way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bodhisattva activity, right there. May all beings not sit on their tea. <laughs> Moistness isn't part of the path. <laughs> he didn't, but there was a close call. So I, I think it's, you know, when we think of practicing on the bodhisattva path, it really kind of fires up our intention to work with this craziness of our mind. And when we were teaching Lojong a couple of years back, we were often going back and forth, Chandra and I, between teaching compassion practices and teaching settling the mind in its natural state. And I'll be doing that again. It's a good combination. So with compassion, what we're forging is our ability to really touch into our own goodness and then experience what it's like to radiate that goodness towards others. And that really, yeah, that really is like a powerful way of understanding, especially the kind of lived, embodied, relational aspect of the path. Right? Compassion is how we relate to the world in a way that helps make us less insane, more kind. And then, you know, kind of polishing that inner lens so that we can see clearly our own mind. Really, really important part of the path. And that means that we have to actually become aware of and bring mindfulness to the mind itself. And there's a couple phases of this. And we'll do a phase or two tonight and a phase or two next week. We become aware that there are thoughts. Phase one. We've all done that a little bit, right? Like not just being in your thought. And the metaphor that the teacher I learned this from, Alan Wallace, often uses is the foreground and the background. So do you have a sense of like, could you imagine like when you have a thought, it's in the foreground? So then what's in the background? Awareness, right? And it's not just in the background, it's in the above ground, it's in the below ground, like it's everywhere. But I think that's a simple way. So if, you know, without a lot of elaboration, can you generate a thought and notice it in the foreground? The thought could be, I hear the bells of the church. Is it possible to notice that thought and then notice the background behind the thought. Some smiles. <laughs> I know this is a little bit 101, but sometimes we gloss over it too quick in meditation. Does that, do we qualitatively know what that feels like? Here's a thought. Okay, prove to me you know what that feels like. What's it like? Tell me about it. Yes, please. This is the best answer, but sometimes I hear myself think things. Like, I heard myself think that 
something I chose was the best decision I've ever made. But do I think it is? I'm like, I don't know. But the thought went poof. Yeah, okay. And you could actually watch it arise and fall. Yeah. Great. And then it was gone. And where, then where were you? I don't remember. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that like noticing, like, like what is that? that's not thought, that space. There's a little sense of wonder and wow, where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. So that's another thought. Yeah. 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 And so what's really interesting uh -huh. is like, we can be aware of the mind's activity. And that's like, most of us can do that pretty well. Like, okay, thoughts arising. I'm aware that's happening. But then when we try to like, what about just what's that awareness? Like what is aware of the thought? It gets a lot trickier. Um, and it's really important to start to kind of cultivate that gently, not force it um, if it doesn't feel real. So this practice, this is like, we're gonna do step one and two and next week, three and four, and we'll keep doing one, two, three, four. So one, two is gonna be aware of the mind's activity and you know, the movement of the mind. Step two is the spaces in between the movement of the mind, just aware of that. Step three, aware of that awareness. Like, whoa, I'm not just aware of the thought, not just the gaps. It's like aware that I am aware. And then step four is unfettered, open, non-conceptual awareness, no subject, no object. No problem. <laughs> it's so much easier than you think. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. Would we like make a big deal out of it? But non-dual awareness is so natural. Creating this fabricated world we live in thought by thought is weird and hard, but we're so used to it. Truly, it's simple, so simple. But I think doing the one and two, it's, it's like, even though it's so simple to be non, like have non-dual awareness, if we don't know it, can't feel it, can't recognize it, like back to Chris's comment at the beginning, if we don't know the warmth we're feeling, we won't be able to recognize it and really utilize it to its best capability. And when we are in that state of non-dual awareness, it is so deeply nourishing. It's so deeply supportive for us in our practice. And often that's where kind of all the garbage dump of our mind starts to just like arise and like pass away, right? That's where, you know, the space, potentially emotions could come and self-liberate instead of they're coming and then we're thinking about them. Oh my God, I hated that experience, right? It's like, it's just this very um, spacious, open, potentially transformative experience. So let's do one and two, but I really want to make sure. Oh, yes, question I online. I wanted to make two share. Yes, oh, hi, Elizabeth. Hi, um, nice to see you. Um, nice to see you. Thank you. So, um, when you were asking about like how um, we would describe that process of um, yeah. kind of zooming out from the thought, um, yes, what comes to mind when when I am, am working through a practice on a thought and, and also on a feeling um, is is this kind of like shiny new toy analogy where like like the feeling of the shiny new toy is when I'm like in it and I've got the shimpa yes. and I've like bit in, yeah. right? And then the shimpa, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and then when I can kind of see that, oh, it's a shiny new toy. Okay, here is the shape or whatever. That's when I've backed out a little more. And then when I can 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 start thinking more about like, okay, does it have purpose? Where do I put this? How do I use it? And um kind of expand out into um how it fits. Um, if it fits, that gets me further into the background, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then you drop the thinking about it altogether. That's the hope. Yes. Because <laughs> it is, it's so, it's so, it's such a, and I love how you describe that. We're like, okay, there's my thought. All right. I see you thought. I see what you're doing. I see how you always do that. And that, you know, that is giving us, we are decentered. We have some distance. And psychotherapeutically speaking, we've done a lot. It's so great to have a little distance from our thought. 
but then to really rest even for a moment in awareness is still distinct. It's like without the thought. Um, so yeah, again, all words, but really useful to kind of consider what we are moving towards. Yeah, something else you said made me um, think about the awareness and you know, the quality of awareness, that's really interesting. Like what is, you know, very classic question in Buddhism, what is the true nature of the mind? I mean, students will ask this to their teachers for lifetimes. What is the true nature of the mind? Like what would most of us say? Garbage dump, I would say, right? <laughs> Wild elephant zone, right? But the true nature of the mind and what that's pointing to is that there is this luminous, unconfigured, expansive space and that we can start to find our way there. It's almost like we're, yeah, we're like, again, we're using the thoughts um, to get to, like we're using the whole energy and power of the thought and then letting go and then finding ourselves like, oh, this is where, this is the space where the thought came from. This is awareness. Yes. Oh, no, well, we're not doing, yeah, we're not doing freak out stuff here. We, um, at least not now, um, hopefully not ever. No, there, it's just more like, so you know how to get back. Like you can, you know, you could, you can kind of like backdoor your way into unconditioned openness through psychedelic drugs, um, through like a big event, like a car accident. You're like, you know, like you're in shock, right? But this is like, let's go there in a way that we actually know how to get back so that maybe we know how to, you know, again, approach it. Um, Cause you know, again, that openness, spaciousness feeling, sometimes it can feel, sometimes it can be very bright, but it could also feel like a little dull and spacey too. And I'm using space too many times, a little dull and, um, yeah, just like not a lot of energy. And so trying to identify and notice that the actual qualities of awareness, subtle, subtle. You're not, not, you're not traumatized us. We're not going to do all those like crazy, which I love, breathing practices that'll fry out your um, lunar channel too quickly. Yeah, yeah, lunar, solar. Yeah, not this class, don't worry. <laughs> not yet, at least. So let's, so this practice, which is actually good for this warm night, it's recommended, we'll start with our eyes closed, but it's actually recommended you have your eyes open for awareness practices of this kind. So that means your gaze down, because I know it's real distracting. I know, it's super, but don't worry, we're only gonna do about 15 minutes of it, which is actually a good amount of time. And so you can begin with eyes closed. And again, if you're feeling really sleepy, you are welcome to stand up. It's a very wonderful position for meditation as well. So let's begin by settling the body in its natural state of ease, stillness, stability. Letting our attention and awareness saturate the field of the body. You can almost feel or imagine that we were an explorer. This was our very first moment of contacting the felt experience of body. What is this body feel like from the inside? Could its natural state be this harmony of 
subtle movement and stillness. And settling the inner speech by focusing on the breath. So in the next breath, as we breathe in, really knowing that we are breathing in through the whole body. And as we breathe out, knowing and sensing as we are breathing out. And continuing this thread of knowing. Inhale and exhale almost as though the breath were breathing us. We could know and feel that. Doesn't matter how many times you get distracted. Just relax and release and return following the breath. Just a little bit longer here, settling into the body, settling the inner speech by focusing on the breath. If the mind feels especially busy, you can simply label the breath, breathing in, breathing out, applying that silently to help tether the mind to the breath. And then very gently, allowing the eyes to be just a little open. And inviting ourselves to settle the mind in its natural state. And qualities of warmth and openness. Feel and imagine that our awareness is above us and below us, around us. No boundary, no limit. And from that awareness, observing without preference or judgment, Whatever activity arises as thought in the mind. Noticing the thoughts in the foreground. Without getting involved or engaged or energizing them in any way. Allowing them to naturally rise and fall like the wave.
you get distracted and pulled away by the thought, no problem. Re-establish yourself in that sense of spacious awareness. And return to observing and noticing the thoughts as they arise. And noticing the space between thoughts where no thought arises. The thoughts may keep coming and coming, no problem. Continuing to see if you can find the background and so you can observe them in the foreground and notice for any gaps that arise and rest in those gaps. If it feels confusing or hard, just relax more deeply in the body. Try not to be in a battle with the thoughts. You don't need to banish them once they arise. And as much as possible, not getting caught up in their story or their allure. Don't be discouraged. Just keep coming back and noticing, no matter how many thoughts, no matter how ridiculous the thoughts, finding that existential ease and pliancy in the body, inviting that ease and pliancy to mind and awareness.
in the gaps we may feel into the question, what is the true nature of mind? Gently allowing the eyes to close, reconnecting with the breath, reestablishing presence in the body more fully. Notice what there's a presence of now in the body and the mind and the heart. Thank you for your practice. Everybody still here? Good. Nobody floated off like Shanti Deva. So curious, what did you notice? What came up? What was interesting or confusing? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, my brain took your suggestion to find the gaps very literally. And I found myself suddenly really pausing both on the inhale and the exhale, mm. just kind of the suspended mm -hmm. moment. And it was lovely, like there was just spaciousness and quiet, just this moment as the body awaited to be breathed mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. And there really was nothing to do or think about uh, because it was breathing. And there's just this kind of suspension mm -hmm. for a moment. Awesome. It was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so, and did the thoughts arise or they just kind of not? Not in the gaps. Wow, so cool. So in the in the breath, yeah. yes. But in that moment where the body was just waiting, like yeah. kind of maybe, are we going to breathe again? Yeah. Maybe it was doing that. Like it, it was like, cool. okay, we're just going to hold and see yeah. if we breathe again. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And that experience of not even knowing what the next breath is, right? Like you actually have to add, wait, do I breathe now? Like, that's a very kind of like unconfigured experience of, um, and that's a really interesting technique that you discovered for yourself. There's one we'll do in a couple weeks where you, you, it's a little bit different, but somewhat you described, you first, you kind of like invert awareness into itself, and then you, act, and then you let it go out again, and you, so you're, you know, that oscillation. So, thank you for sharing. Wonderful. Yeah. And how did you experience yourself at the end of the sit? Uh, well, just warm. 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 Yes. Well, it's, yes. Warm yeah. 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 So Good. Thank you. Anybody else? What else did you notice? What else was happening or not happening? How many, anybody have some thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Did they get shy ever? Okay. Let's get this woman a mic behind you. Okay, good. Whoever. Okay. I have a 
Oh. Oh. I have a question. So yeah, I guess now I'm used to visualization and during the practice when you guided, imagine the awareness yeah. as the vast yeah. sky, I guess there's imagery arise. Mm. Would that be um, actively generating a visual thought? Yes. I know, but it's okay. I mean, it's like it, a lot of the stuff with awareness, I feel like it's, you know, kind of like we need the training wheels so then we can just coast, you know, um, like we have to find that feeling because I imagine when you think of the vast sky, I don't even think I said sky, but you're attuned to it, right? Yeah. Okay. So when you um, have that, you can actually feel it because there's an image and then you just rest in it. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like flapping your wings and then gliding on what arises yeah Thank you. and how can i ask how was it how was it to like look more directly at the thoughts um there it it was less energetic than i thought i have a lot of stability throughout this practice yeah yeah it's probably because you have a dedicated practice every day yeah nice yeah. good showing through thank you can we bring it back here to Tanya? Hi. Hi there. <laughs> um, I don't think I had one moment of like quiet. <laughs> I really don't think so. <laughs> First, this Madonna song was playing the entire time. <laughs> Open your heart to me. Oh, and <laughs> Like, okay, and then also just like constant thoughts. They were pleasant, yeah, but they were constant. Yeah, and it almost, it almost felt like being in um, on a roundabout in a very busy city where like, just like thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. It's exciting yeah. and stimulating, yeah. but um, yeah, I was. Like, oh, Good. I got, I got a ways to go. It. I got a ways to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think, and it's interesting because it generally, I think we can have that sense of dense, unending thoughts when they're difficult, but to notice it when they're kind of entertaining or pleasant or neutral, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but that that is kind of like it is constantly filling the mind, right? Yeah. And. Um, knowing you a couple of decades as I do. <laughs> Dang, you can understand. It's, it's not in the way of like your life, right? Yeah. And it's interesting to know and to think like, when are the, there those opportunities for that like kind of taste of this mind without the thought? Yeah. Yeah. Which feels very exciting. Yeah. I mean, liberating, I have yeah. to say. Yeah. yeah. And this gentleman was. Right? Thank you. Yeah. I find it interesting that for me is um, I enjoy the uh, the the space the spaceness the spaceness in the, uh, in the back for some reason. it's not it's not amplified. oh it's just me <laughs> yeah. um, so it, you know I enjoy the spaceness between the thoughts yeah. and so it's easy for me to become aware of the thought and say okay there's a thought and just kind of let it go in the foreground or in the background but what I find it difficult is that as soon as that I'm in that space spaceness or that emptiness yeah. i enjoy it and i sink into it and the next thing i know i'm in the middle of a thought like i wake up in a thought and i'm like it just sneaks in i'm like shit that goes another <laughs> thought like so as soon as i let my guard down because it's easy for me to be aware but as soon as i sink into that yeah. awareness yes and i'm there and i let my guard down and the next thing i know is I'm hearing that Madonna song. Yes. You know, so. <laughs> Tanya was playing it, I know. Um, that's such a good description. It's so true. You're like, what? How have I been on this thought train, right? That's like, you know, many cars in. Like, I'm on the caboose. Like, this train has been coming. And it's, you know, I think it's, I actually think it's really exciting to try this practice often. Because you also notice, like, there's the Madonna thought, song kind of thoughts. There's the, like, repetitive, like, that email I didn't write kind of thought. There's, like, these memories. And they all have a different quality. And we can become really curious. And that can help the kind of wakefulness part. And I think what you're bringing up, which is such an important point, is awareness is not just vacuity, not just emptiness. There is, like, 
a brightness to it. I'm, I'm not trying to give you the answer or tell you what to feel, <clears throat> but to notice like sometimes the space of it, we're actually losing awareness, we're going into dullness. And that's when the thought just comes. And so it's interesting because we don't want to be like vigilant in our mind, but we also can't get too lax because we lose that kind of clarity. So often called, you know, crystal clear clarity of awareness, you know, with awareness like that crystal so that anything will come through and become a rainbow. Um, yeah, but really good noticing. And I just, I'm excited for us in the coming weeks to just get a little bit more interested and invested in this observation of thoughts and also exploration of awareness. Um, there's, there's quite a lot to be benefited from there. And again, when we're doing this with the intention of our Bodhisattva vow, it's very different than we're doing it to get bliss. It's not different in how it feels. It's not different in what I teach, but it is different. And that is such an important container for us here. So let's dedicate the merit of our practice. Sorry to go over a minute here. <clears throat> so returning to the body, the breath, this beautiful collection of beings here tonight. Again, checking in with the, with the body. What does it feel like at this moment? And how's the heart, and the emotion body? Noticing mind. And then considering and feeling into whether there's some energy that's been generated tonight by this dedicated practice and placing hands together at the heart, if it's comfortable in a symbolic gesture, we offer this energy, this intention, this collective effort so that all beings of all time could know peace and ease, all beings of all time could feel belonging and love, and that all beings of all time could be free from inner and outer harms, that all beings everywhere could be perfectly free. Thank you all. I feel like that was a little bit of a journey tonight. It was good. Weaving through.